Spring has officially sprung here in Central Texas and in many other parts of the U.S. and around the world. So we decided that an episode dedicated to fleas, ticks, and heartworms was in order. Spoiler alert, there isn't a one-size-fits-all answer for reasons such as how vitally healthy is your pet? Is your pet's body already overloaded with toxins? What risk do you have in your neck of the woods? So in today's episode, we'll be chatting about traditional flea and tick products, why we don't trust or recommend them, alternatives to traditional flea and tick products, and what specifically we do for our dogs and cats. We hope you find this episode helpful. It has taken us many years to gather this information and personal knowledge to pass on to you to hopefully help your pets thrive. And before we jump into the opening of the podcast, I'm going to give you just a little teaser right now. You know, I still have people asking me about those stupid Soresto collars. Yeah. In what in what <laughs> context? Like, can I put them on my dog? Well, isn't that like, one of them that no. Dr. Judy says is okay? I thought Soresto. Let me look this up. Soresto. You look it up on her website. She's got one uh, of them that she talks about. There are some that yeah, I've heard them talk about. Um, what's the one that they've been trying to pull off the market? 380 and 381. So it is that 379 through 381. And the Forever Dog book? Yeah. Starting on 379. Veterinary pesticide support. Because what, what I liked about... Oh, that was it. It was a checklist. It is Soresto. Should be recalled after 2,500 pet deaths, lawmakers say. When? How mm. recent was that? It's based on a congressional report. Um, 20, J- June 2022. Wow. Last year. Findings linked to 100,000 incidents, including 2,500 pet deaths, according to a congressional report. Wow. So, yeah, I thought it was Soresto. Soresto flea collar. It's crazy. I know, right? But yeah, I still see them. Like, I, I, I think I was in, I walked in Petco the other day, I think the other day, a couple weeks ago. And I think I saw a, a, like a stand right there out front. Of Soresto. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. You need to print out that warning and go in there with a piece of tape and... <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. As a pet parent, you face more challenges with your dogs and cats today than ever before in history. What's the best food to feed? How do I prevent illness and help them live longer? Maybe you currently have a pet living with disease or behavioral issues and you need a different approach for success. Welcome to the Pet Health Junkies podcast. We're so happy you're here. Pam Roussel is a holistic health practitioner specializing in holistic health for animals. Janet Cesarini is a healthy pet store owner and advocate for health through nutrition. Jessica Fisher is a pet parent coach and positive reinforcement dog trainer. Join us as we share our stories, experiences, and all that we've learned to change the way we think about raising our pets. We're breaking it all down and making it simple by sharing how we help pet parents just like you every day. Because when we know better, we can do better. So on page 380, I want to talk about this. It says, um, you know, we try to get people to be logical and to assess their risk to make a decision that's informed. And so she has, or they have six questions here. Like number one, does my pet have underlying medical issues that would further complicate, you know, by using pesticides, Um, especially talking about liver or any congenital birth defect? Um, Do I live in a low, medium or high 
risk area for certain parasites like flea tick and mosquito. Um, if I live in a medium or a high risk area, how often are my pets exposed? Daily, weekly, monthly, and you know, how long um, is our exposure year round? And how willing, you know, is a person willing to check for fleas and ticks? I know with dogs mm -hmm. like mine, it's much, much harder. And I run my fingers through them, but I don't go through with a comb. And um, then it says, do I have a detox protocol ready to go? If I live in a very high risk area and I spend a lot of time outside, I'm probably stuck using some type of chemicals, but the type and the frequency of the application should be adjusted during lower risk months. And this is where the reasonableness comes in that vets never talk about. They just want you to do it 12 months a year because we quote unquote in Texas live in a hot spot. Well, you know, yeah, I even heard Dr. Chang say that Saturday. Well, you know, it's Texas. So, so <laughs> yeah, um, it, it, it's pretty crazy because I have to say on all of that hype, when I moved here, I did a ton of research for both flea and tick and heartworm because I, even though I had been nat naturally raising my pets as, yeah. as best I could, yeah. um, for years I was I was terrified. I'm like, oh my gosh, what am I getting myself into? Like, how am I going to manage this? <laughs> right. Yeah. And then, yeah, they make it sound like if you walk out the door, you're going to be attacked by fleas and ticks. Yeah. And like every dog is going to get heartworm. Like they, yes. It, yes. it was terrifying mm -hmm. um, preparing to move here. Like I, at one point was like, so scared that I was just going to, have to have to do the you know chemical stuff and then i just kept kept digging in and kept researching and kept looking at statistics and kept looking at you know the veterinarians that i trust and the information they were putting out and i was like put up you know i figured it out and i put my plan in place and so far you know we're knock on wood <laughs> we've been good <laughs> yeah that's good yeah but Bring yeah, that so do you, when, when people think about having to protect their dogs and cats from fleas and ticks and mosquitoes, they, I mean, it's just, we have been conditioned for so many years, decades at this point to just get the, get the medicine quote, yeah. quote unquote medicine from your veterinarian right mm -hmm. and then of course there are those people that are like oh my gosh that is so expensive so they're they go to target or walmart and they're like i hope this is going to be good enough and they use that stuff um whatever they can find there and there is a difference i, I mean not much <laughs> but there you know there are some differences between what you can get over the counter and what you can get from your veterinarian but I, I personally think there's just so many risks associated with, it doesn't matter if it's oral or topical or a collar or a chew or what, like whatever it is, there's so many risks associated with it. Um, and there's just so much more we could, people don't understand they could be doing. So... I'm, I'm, I'm here to, You're I have plenty that I could talk about, but I'm here to listen to what y'all have to say too. <laughs> You're talking about the options, just people knowing that there yeah, are. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that's where people where like where they, they start in their head, right? They're like, well, this is, my vet says I have to have some sort of protection, protection right. for my dog. Preventative. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, Even, um, Mm -hmm. Even indoor cats, which boggles my <laughs> mind, but <laughs> I will <laughs> go ahead, Pam. <laughs> I think the Do they think we're stupid? <laughs> they must be stupid. No. It it's complicated. 
And I mean, for an, an indoor only cat that lives in the city. Yeah. <laughs> even I mean, if they're, even if they're in the country, you know, it's just like, like I used to tell my ex just because they, the cats go into the yard doesn't mean they're going to get fleas because fleas are not everywhere. You Depend, know, depends on my the yard. Went outside, <laughs> and my cat never got fleas in yeah. our in the lot next door to us. Yeah, but that doesn't mean that another person's yard who has a dog that's flea riddled isn't going to have some fleas in their yard. It really depends. It does. So you can't lump it all into one bucket and say, "Don't let your dog or cat go outside because they're going to get fleas." That's not true. Yeah, I think your point is very valid and fair. I had, yes, I, I, I had not been giving my indoor cats flea and tick topical flea and tick medication for years. Um, and one of my cats had a really nasty, like gross ear infection thing that couldn't, my vet couldn't get it to go away. And this was this was years ago before I knew a whole heck of a lot about um, holistic modalities. And at one point he was like, maybe it's mites and I'm just not seeing it. Like, you know, so he wanted to do two rounds of revolution. And the first round that I gave him, because I was like, I didn't know what else to do at the point at that point, And this had been going on for a while. Um, he got a chemical burn from it. Mm-hmm. And that to me, I called the vet and I said, he has a chemical burn from this. And the vet was like, well, he needs another dose. And I was like, you're out of your mind. Not, I'm not doing it. Yeah. <laughs> and so I think, especially for our indoor cats, there's so much more to consider other than just, are they exposed to fleas or not? Like, I would much rather have to clean up fleas and, and, you know, clean my home and dive into how do I keep my home free of fleas? What do I need to do? How do I keep my yard clean so that I don't get this flea problem again? Because if that happens to you, you're going to go down that rabbit hole to figure it out. Then to deal with the consequences of the flea and tick preventatives that they push on us. (laughs) So yeah, to tie it together, what each of you just said, you know, you mentioned indoor cats versus those that go outside or even dogs. And then, um, you know, you talking about Jessica, the, the unfortunate chemical burn from what pesticide was put on your pet. Um, it comes back to like what they talk about. It's being mm-hmm. logical and really looking, taking a step back and looking at um, your situation. So if you have a yard that you treat, hopefully naturally, um, because if your pets go out there, what, you know, their paws are, like the bottoms of our shoes, only our shoes protect us from absorbing things that we would otherwise walk across or walk into, you know, like think about walking across a gas station parking lot. Um, but, you know, they, they transmit things through their paw pads. So mm-hmm. hopefully we're using something that's natural, um, like um, diatomaceous earth. Like we recently learned about the coffee ground trick you know, putting coffee grounds. I haven't tried that yet. I want to, if anybody's tried that, I hope that you'll comment and tell us how that worked out, but yeah, yeah, spreading coffee grounds in your yard, you know, those are things that are going to be non-toxic, um, sidebar. It'll smell great. It'll smell good. And provided that you don't have, you know, like my, I would worry about my Chowini who goes out there and eats everything. I would have to watch him to make sure he doesn't lick up the coffee grounds, but, um, just being, logical about it and analytical about it. And, um, in the book that, um, I was reading about what Dr. Becker and and Rodney Habib have said about flea and tick and just parasite prevention. 
and starting with, you know, the yard situation, you keep that environment, you know, clear of parasites, then most likely you aren't going to have a problem for the pet that goes in and outside. Like at our home, our pets that we don't go to dog parks, I, we've had been seen and we still hear too many, you know, issues at dog parks. So we, we don't go, I don't know how they treat if they do treat the, that area. Um, Mm -hmm. our dogs in large part just stay within our neighborhood, but our neighborhood has a lot of wildlife like deer, fox, um, possums, squirrels, all of those carry parasites. So, um, we treat our yard naturally. And we also chose several years ago to, um, treat the dogs with natural flea tick and uh, mosquito prevention. Um, and it's because their risk is relatively low. I mean, they aren't engaging with the deer and the fox and the squirrels and, and everything else. Mm-hmm. When we go on a walk around the neighborhood where those you know animals also live, because if they go in the tall grass, chances are they could get a tick um, or any other number of parasites. I mean, it's our responsibility as pet parents to keep them out of stagnant water, just like it is. We need to, you know, give them prevention um, techniques from to be free from parasites. So we spray them with a natural essential oil spray. And, um, you know, you can make your own or you can buy it um, in an independent pet store that carries, you know, natural flea tick and, you know, mosquito prevention. Um, Mm -hmm. But... I want to throw out a couple of questions from the book talking the about forever dog book. Yeah. The forever yeah. dog book. So, um, number one, and I think this is so important and I'm so grateful that they brought it up is just like our discussion on vaccines, you know, in the insert for vaccines and just like with flea tick and mosquito parasite prevention, you need to be dealing with a healthy pet. And so this question is, does my dog have any underlying medical issues that would further be complicated by the use of pesticides? You know, we assume that that if the FDA says it's safe for use in X, Y, and Z, that it's across the board, and that's not the case. Um, just like with your rabies vaccine or any other vaccine, it, you know, those inserts mm-hmm. say that it's for healthy pets. Um, So if you've got a pet that has underlying medical issues, most definitely I would encourage you if you were in front of me to go the natural route and not add insult to injury. Yes, and I would add, uh, add to that. First of all, especially to animals that have seizure disorders, Yes, Mm -hmm. um, because you're adding neurotoxins on top of a neurological disorder. But I, there, when we think of, you know, looking for a natural alternative, there are some natural alternatives that I also would not recommend for an animal with a seizure disorder okay. because there are some that use like electromagnetic technology that's also mm-hmm. not good for animals with neurological disorders. So um, really dig into like what your pet's health issue is and make sure you are putting that first. That's an excellent point. We saw some of those. Um, that was new for, for us when we went to our pet expo a few weeks ago. And I saw that and I, you know, turned the box over and I was reading about the technology. And at first I was really intrigued in a good way. And then, you know, knowing what I know about like using an ACC loop on a tumor, you know, most cases you don't want to do that. It can, you know, make things worse and do the opposite. Mm. And I was concerned about that. And I don't know, I know nothing about the the new technology and, and I don't want to misspeak and say that it's something it isn't, but it, it definitely um, is something that to be researched, like you're mentioning. So thanks mm-hmm. for saying that. And so the next question is, do, do I live in a low, medium or high risk area for certain parasites? You know, um, Texas gets lit up bright red for 
all of the above, <laughs> flea tick and um, mosquitoes. Um, although in southern Texas is, you know, worse. Um, mm-hmm. But coastlines. Coastline. And that's where we, we come from, the coastline. And oh my gosh, I kid you not, it, it is pretty horrible during mosquito season to go home. You cannot walk from the house to the car without being swarmed. And by the time you get into the car, you've got a couple of dozen mosquitoes in the car with you. It is that prevalent. Um, Mm -hmm. You, I can't describe it. When we, the last time we went last year during that, that season, I was mortified and horrified. And I was very concerned about my dogs. I was like, if we lived here, we probably would have to strongly consider doing something for mosquito, you know, protection. And then of Mm -hmm. course I would do a detox with it. So that's later, but anyhow, so looking at your risk um, area for the parasites, and then they go on to say that if you're in a medium or high risk area, um, you want to look at how often you're exposed to the parasites. You know, are you on daily, you know, hikes? Are you um, out once a week? Do you go out maybe monthly? And so using that logic too to say, okay, you know, if we're going out a few times a month, do I really need to um, use the toxins? Or, you know, am I more comfortable with using the natural? And we're, we're going to talk about the toxin that we're talking about. Um, is my exposure year round? Obviously, if your exposure is year round, Um, again, you want to, you know, think about it a little bit more in depth and, you know, do research and find the best decision for you. Um, are you willing to regularly and thoroughly check for visible parasites? So if you go to on a hike and go down by the water, um, are you going to run a comb through your dog or, you know, do a visual check? Um, you know, those are things that take time and everybody's busy. Um, do you have a detox protocol that's ready to go? For example, if you live in a high risk area and you spend a lot of time outside, you probably are going to be stuck using chemical. You just may very well. Um, so the type and the frequency of the application should be adjusted during lower risk seasons. So like here where where I am, we have a mosquito season. And I remember several years ago when I started down this more natural path and I had learned that the chemicals from, and I think we were doing trifexis at the time. And one of my Aussies started to refuse to take the beef flavored chew. Um, And I had started around that same time smelling like I told my husband, they smelled like lawn chemicals and pesticides. And then Charlie quit wanting to take it. Whereas before he was all gung ho. Um, And that's coincidentally guys, if you're listening, that's why they put flavoring in these things. So every time we hear pet parents say, Oh my gosh, they love it. I cringe. Um, you wouldn't yeah, love eating wanna pesticides. Huh? <laughs> it makes me want to throw up just the thought of it. I'm the like, thought of it. I mean, you're eating chemi- lawn chemicals, pesticides, you know, chemicals. <laughs> um, and so Charlie was the one that made me listen to my intuition. And that was when I turned the box around and I pulled out the little paper and I started searching online for what these long scientific names yeah. were. And my mind was blown in a, not a good way. And I remember telling Chris, I said, I know we just dropped $250 on these things because we had five dogs, you know, from 12 Mm -hmm. pounds to 75 pounds. So they all get, you know, their own little thing. I threw them in the trash and that hurt. (laughs) That hurt um, from a monetary, like monetary standpoint, but it was Mm -hmm. the first time that I kind of took a stand on, okay, I'm going to, basically, I'm going to go be an independent thinker and I'm going to do research and I'm going to go with my gut 
and their indoor dogs, even though we were on the coast, uh, we we're about an hour in from the coast. Um, and I just said, you know, they're not exposed to it. And, and at that time, I didn't know of natural remedies. And so we were, I'm sorry to say, we were taking our chances. And, you know, you can bet your sweet dollar that we were doing the heartworm, you know, test um, twice a year at, at just to make sure they were okay. But um, by the time that we moved to where we are now, um, I had learned about natural remedies and had much more peace about the fact that we weren't using, you know, the trifexis anymore, the heart mm -hmm. guard. Um, so um, back to this, if you're going to have to use some chemicals, you need to um, look at the type and the frequency of the application, adjust it during those lower risk months when it's not quote unquote mosquito season. Um, and if it says here that they recommend a detox protocol because your dog's pesticide body burden will be unrelenting. And if you have the forever dog book, it's on page 380 where I'm reading from. Um, mm -hmm. And it says that the microbiologist that we interviewed suggested using probiotics and microbiome biome supportive protocols if flea and tick chemicals are routinely used. So, you know, you want to support the gut, like we talk about all the time on the show, and you want to support liver and kidneys, you know, mm -hmm. with, and there's several healthy, wonderful products on the market that do both of those things. Um, also, they talk about if you live in a high risk environment, but you have low exposure, like in my case, the dogs were inside, even though we were in a mosquito ridden uh, location. Um, they talk about beans. What makes the most sense maybe is rotating natural deterrents with chemical preventatives. Um, and then they talk about like in a tick endemic area, they recommend performing a tick borne illness screening test with your veterinarian mm -hmm. at least once a year regardless of using natural or chemical prevention. because And that brings us to the next thing that we often think that the chemicals are 100% effective. There is nothing that is 100% effective. Not then, only do people think they're 100% effective, but they don't know how they actually work. <laughs> and that's the other thing. So do you want to talk about that? Sure. Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So when you use these chemical, I, they're neurotoxins. That's, yeah. let's just get to the bottom. They're neurotoxins. Mostly isozazoline. <laughs> yes. It's either going to be, well, the, the two, two most common ones are fipronil and isozazoline. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and it may not say that on the label. There are, uh, I, I have, some lists of the most popular flea and tick medications that are fipronil based and isozazoline based. But whether you're giving this orally or topically, it is not preventing fleas, ticks, and mosquitoes from landing on and biting your dog or cat. No. Instead, when this parasite does land on your pet and takes a bite, and draws blood, they are drawing blood laced with these neurotoxin chemicals. Yes. So, and, and that is then going to kill, they say, kill the flea, tick, or mosquito. So that's how they actually work. They're not preventing these pests from attacking your animal. And really what we're doing is turning our pets into little chemical bombs for these pets. Like they're, they're mm -hmm. actively they're poisoning their blood. Yes. yes. We are actively yeah. poisoning their blood. And one of the really interesting things that um, a study titled the effects of fipronil on emotional and cognitive behaviors in mammals, which Rodney Habib shared a while back, um, showed that these neurotoxins are going everywhere in the body, that they even pass through the blood-brain barrier. So 
They are being found in every organ and muscle tissue and brain matter, literally everywhere. Um, let's see. They said any adipose tissue, testes, liver, adrenal glands, kidneys, spleen, heart, olfactory, the brain, um, the skin, it's literally going everywhere in your pet. Yeah. And because that's it's traveling through the body in the blood. Yeah. And that's exactly yes. right. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that's how they actually work. They're, they're not preventing anything. Mm -mm. Um, they're, they're harming your pet in order to kill the pests, which is why I think we are all three so passionate about yes. educating people on what these quote unquote medications. I don't think, I don't, I don't think they're med like there, there's no, I don't know what the upside is to your pet. Um, so I'm not really like, I don't feel comfortable calling it a medication, but I know that's what they call them. <laughs> in, Prevent, um, prevent prevention, preventative. Yeah, it's like, they're, it's not like preventing, they're not preventing, they're not preventing anything, anything either. So <laughs> I, I don't even know what to call it. I just call them neurotoxins. Yeah. I don't know. And let's, let's tell people what a neurotoxin is. It is toxic to the nervous system. It damages the nervous system. It can cause paralysis. It confuses the, it interrupts like the normal neuro pathways that function in the brain and the muscles and the nerves and all of that. So, you know, these, these pests get exposed to this and it kills them. <laughs> it can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, some it, of them, they yeah. don't, they, they still don't die because, you know, uh, have you guys heard of, of some of these pests like becoming um, more tolerant to some of these things over time? Yes. So you have to keep doing more and more and more and more because they're, they become, um, they adjust I guess what's the word I'm looking for? Um, the body becomes more um, immune to it almost, or you know, it's yeah. just it's less effective over time. So yeah. you have to keep upping the ante. We could apply that yeah. to a lot of things. And um, so think about to, what that's doing to your pet. Yeah, I mean, so it's just here, raising their toxic burden. That's exactly what you know they were saying in the book is that it's unrelenting because it's constantly mm -hmm. twenty four seven circulating mm -hmm. through the bloodstream. That's um, right. So this is page 379. And um, it said in a recent survey, and this book was published in 2022, y'all. In a recent survey of dog owners using isozazoline products for flea tick and uh, mosquito prevention, 66% reported some kind of a reaction to that specific ingredient. And on September 20th of 2018, so at the time that we're recording this, five years ago, almost, well, four and a half years ago, the FDA issued a warning that products containing isozazoline cause adverse events in pets, including muscle tremors, ataxia, and seizures. Mm -hmm. The FDA um, has worked with those manufacturers of isozazoline products to include appropriate neurologic warning on their label labels. But how many of us read it? I mean, I didn't. I don't. And, and y'all. Yeah. Well, <laughs> because you assume if you're, if your vet is selling it to you, if I can go to Petco and I can buy it off the shelf, it's safe. Otherwise it would, they wouldn't sell it to me. Yeah. That's I, how our rational mind yeah. thinks about stuff like this. I think because we, we think, don't turn it over and look at the back. Exactly. It's like, if why would it be on the shelf if it were safe? It's like rawhide. Don't get us yep. started on rawhide, rawhide y'all. <laughs> but quit feeding it to your pets. It's full of bleach and formaldehyde and it doesn't digest. Um, okay. So <laughs> that was my PSA. Um, every pesticide yeah. comes with its own set of risks and benefits, depending on how well your dog's detox pathways are functioning. And that means mm -hmm. depending on, uh, depending upon how well they can, um, get rid of the chemicals, clear the chemicals in their bodies. Um, and that has to do with dosing frequency, their immune health, and so many other variables, you know, age exposure, like you were saying. So, um, you know, it's a really serious subject. And the, the fact that the FDA 
came out and said something four and a half years ago, but we still are not hearing about it. This still is news to, gosh, 90% of the people that walk through our door mm -hmm. still don't know that well, they're I don't natural. Think that, I don't think messages like that make the front page headlines or the the nightly news. Messages that or, help. <laughs> they don't want people to know that information because who controls the purse strings? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You got to follow the money. That's why that kind of information is not publicized. True. It's and, the I mean, there, there, mm -hmm. there are so many things that we can and will continue to talk about um, with Fipronil and isozazoline products. And um, I just wanted to kind of give everybody like a, I don't know, 10,000 foot view of we're not just talking about the effects to your dog and cat because True. the uh, study that I was just talking about where the fipronil is literally traveling everywhere in your dog or cat's body, these same researchers are seeing that it is, it's disrupting the um, GABA receptors in our, in the brain, but they're also studying bodies of water and finding fipronil um, in bodies of water yep. all over the world. Mm -hmm. And it's poisoning the, the water. It's poisoning the, the um, yes, mm -hmm. all of the animals that live in the water, all of the fish, all of the marine life. And it also says that just one application of a fipronil flare tick treatment has the ability to kill 60 million bees. What? So we're not only damaging our dogs and cats, but we are mm -hmm. literally damaging like all of the environment around us. Because when you put this medication, I, I don't know why I keep calling it medication. When you put this neurotoxin on your pet, like your, like your dog, and then they jump in the river mm. or you give them a bath, where does that water go? True. And all of these chemicals are being leached everywhere, all over, all over the world. And, and it's I really would, detrimental. I would also add that they're getting into us. Yes. Because if your dog and cat have this on their skin, on their fur, and you're petting them and they're sleeping in your bed and all that, guess what? It's in you too. Yes. <laughs> So because they, you can't avoid that. And they don't they talk about on administering these types of um, drugs, chemicals that it should they wear touch gloves, your skin. They don't get it on your skin. Yeah. And then don't pet your dog for like at least an hour or something. Wait until it dries. Even that right Are you there. Kidding me? Yeah. That right there. That should yeah. be a warning. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. It should be a warning <laughs> sign to us. Yeah. But we, we've yeah. got to take uh -huh. back our ability to be independent thinkers and critical thinkers. And, you know, our, the system, we'll call it, has made us reliant and in some ways. Not, not um, question. We, yeah. We've been taught to stop questioning or we've become a little bit lackadaisical about um, taking ownership of our own decisions. And, you know, we think that if, well, the FDA said it's, you know, safe, but how many of you watch um, commercials and then you hear all the fine print that they have to, you know, say at, you know, sped up so that you can't yeah. hear yeah. all the side effects. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and for some people mm -hmm. that it's, it's a chance that you want to take, Maybe you live on, you know, land that like I described going home to visit, you know, my hometown and literally were swarmed by mosquitoes. I mean, that's pretty serious. And in that instance, you're going to need something pretty heavy duty. But like, you know, the good doctor says, let's come up with a protocol to support the immune system and to detox the body. Um, and there are so many, you know, so much information out there to do the research and make a, an informed decision. Um if you ladies are ready, I, I really want to talk about diet and gut health um, as it relates to our pets. Yeah, I think attractive. really, yeah, really yeah. quickly. Um, 
before we get into that, I want, I have not an exhaustive list, but I do have a longer list of uh, some of the symptoms of neurotoxicity Oh yeah, that Go I think it. would be really good to just kind of take a moment and give people yeah. this list to look for, because every time you, you give one of these neurotoxins to your pet, it's, it's compounding. Yes. So you mm-hmm. may not see, you may not see like a huge difference the first time, but maybe three years down the road, you're seeing this like compounding, um, toxicity. It's called and, toxic load. Mm-hmm. I think, um, was so, it Dr. Morgan that did a, a segment on that? And she talked about, you know, your dog's fine, your dog's fine, your dog's fine. And then one day they're not fine. And yeah. it's, and a lot of times it's with the seizuring. Um, mm-hmm. yes. and it was she that, mm-hmm. that yeah. did a segment on that. Probably so. Mm-hmm. She probably ran um, it. Yes. So <laughs> some of the, I'm sure, <laughs> some of the symptoms of neurotoxicity include paralysis or weakness of the limbs, tingling, numbness, or other sensations of the limbs. So they might like walk a little weird, like they can't (laughs) feel right. Um, Headache, which we may not always notice in our pets, vision loss, cognitive dysfunction, and loss of memory, obsessive and or compulsive behaviors, sometimes uncontrollable, behavioral problems, depression, poor circulation, imbalance, and flu-like symptoms um, are some of the ones that are like not super talked about. Like we talk about seizures a lot and we talk about, I mean, your dog could have vomiting or diarrhea because again, it's a toxin we're giving them. Mm -hmm. Um, But these are some of the ones that aren't really talked about a whole lot. So I want to make sure people are like, thinking about it and looking out for these things. Can I make one comment on that? You said headaches. If your if your pet is pressing their head against something, a lot of times they have pain and they're pushing. So that can be a sign. If they are pushing into you or in something, um, or if they're pawing, it, it could be a sign of headache. Yep. Good point. Yes. We, yes, very you, good point. One of the cases that we saw, um, or a customer that came in, she had a tiny Yorkie, like five pounds, and it was a very young Yorkie. So we didn't have these years, you know, of toxic load, like you mentioned, Pam. But she mm-hmm. came in and she's like, my dog was fine. And then all of a sudden she's doing this. And she put the dog down and the dog was going in circles. I mean, it was like a wind up toy and I had never seen that with my own eyes. I'd only heard of it. And we asked if she had recently given her flea tick and heartworm, um, pill and she had. And so we had the discussion Mm -hmm. about this. I mean, we don't know for sure, but if you, you know, you're fine. And then you look at your timeline of events and what you have done, you know, where have you gone? What have you given to your pet? Um, Mm -hmm. What have they eaten? And, um, you know, she was comfortable with the conclusion that it probably was the flea tick and mosquito um, chew that she had given her dog. And so she was going to go and research, um, you know, what to do, what she could do going forward. And, just we gave her a little bit of information and so that she could take it and then go research it on her own. But that was, that was pretty scary. Um, I think I've seen other extreme cases or heard of other extreme cases where a dog like shredded an entire couch and just like almost, they act like they have rabies. They just Mm. flip out. Um, When you're talking about the kindest, most sweet dog, and that, I think, again, it was, I want to say it was Dr. Morgan again that was talking about the, um, they can act like they have rabies, or maybe it was the rabies vaccine that she was talking about. Do y'all recall that? No, but that's... Certainly behavioral issues are are seen with the, you know, the, the toxin overload, but yeah, for sure, like... It, the, the rabies vaccine or any vaccine, 
um, you can potentially see symptoms of the disease you're trying to that's it. vaccinate yeah. against. Especially that's if it. it has heavy metals in it. Say that again. Especially if it has heavy metals. Yes. By Marisol or aluminum. Yeah, because that goes to the brain. And Pam, you actually did um, a blog post about rabies miasm, like a, I, did. I don't know, a little over yes. a month ago, yeah. right? Yes. So it's it's been a while, but it it's got a lot of really good symptoms for people to look at. Yeah. Mm hmm. So, is there anything else? So, with you you want to talk about the gut health and the? <laughs> I think it's I think it's important for people to know since we're moving into this that parasites. Are, track, are attracted to the weakest host. So if you, if, if your pet is not, you know, super healthy, even though we might look at it and think it's healthy, but really how healthy is it? You know, what diet are you feeding? What are they exposed to? Are you doing regular detox and, and supportive measures for the gut? Like Jeanette was saying, um, be, and the, and the true indication is, Put your dog outside and see if he if he attracts fleas or ticks <laughs> and put another dog outside that that is riddled with fleas and ticks and they don't necessarily equal the other. So a really super healthy dog may have one or two just, you know, as a consequence of going in a real riddled area, but another one might be just, just be covered. Yeah. And that's an indication of how healthy their gut is, like you said, and what are they attracting? Yeah. And, you know, when you talk about gut health um, and we even have to talk about like blood, when you talk about acidic versus alkaline, um, if you have a pet or a person who has acidic blood, they're more attractive to parasites like mosquitoes. And um, the way to achieve, you know, healthy blood means you are a healthy person or a healthy pet. And it goes to what you were saying, Pam, about, you know, look at the diet and are you supporting the gut with pre and probiotics? And, you know, are we doing a good, healthy omega? Um, because we know that if you're feeding a dry food, the heat destroys any, you know, semblance of omegas. So we've got to put it back in and we want fish based omegas versus plant based. So, you know, it, we can go down a rabbit hole, but we, what we're trying to say here, guys, is that, you know, the healthier the pet and, a, and raw feeders and which we are proponents of, um, typically a raw fed dog is not attractive to parasites like fleas, ticks, and mosquitoes. Now, is that a hundred percent, you know, passport that you're going to be, you know, if you feed your dog raw, you give them a pre and probiotic. Um, you're doing all the things to support their organs. Um, does that mean they're never going to have a flea tick or, you know, be attracted to a mosquito? No. I mean, there's nothing that's 100%, but we've got to, you know, do everything that we can within reason um, for helping to protect them from those parasites. And if we have, if we determine that we need to do the chemicals then we need to, like, you know, Dr. Becker says and all the other, you know, um, integrative veterinarians out there say, holistic veterinarians say, we've got to support and detox the, the system. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. On a regular basis. Because they do have an accumulated toxic load. Yeah. So yeah. like you said, you may not see necessarily symptoms until the body is no longer able to keep all those things happening on the inside and they start to show up superficially, you know, yeah. on the surface. And so know that those things have been going on at the cellular level for a long time mm -hmm. until the body just can't suppress it anymore. And it's like <laughs> flags are coming out going, we have a problem here. You yeah. Know? The body See can't handle symptoms? it anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> symptoms. Yeah. So hopefully yeah. we can do you know, less toxic load so that we don't get there so that we don't exactly. have to react. We, again, you know, the, our whole purpose as pet health junkies is to try to be proactive and do as much as we can naturally. But, you know, 
and just do what's in the best interest, you know, of our pets. And, mm-hmm. and that goes for, our, you know, people as well. We want what is in the best interest of every, you know, living creature. Um, and being proactive is, in our opinion, better than being re- reactive. It's easier. It is easier. You know, it's hard to make up for lost time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One other thing that I did want to mention is that, um, of course, we we want to feed the best foods possible. Um, and, you know, we, of course, we'll, we'll see. We tend to see when somebody switches from a highly processed diet, diet to a fresh food diet, we see, like, this immediate, like, burst of health um, and vitality. Mm-hmm. And that's great. That's wonderful. But we don't want to stop there. Um, Dr. Will Falconer uh, has actually said many, many times that he, while he is a very big proponent for raw feeding as well, his number one at the top of his list for um, keeping your pet healthy is not to damage your pet with over vaccination. So he even placed in, you know, different vets are going to tell you different things, but he places over vaccination even above higher feeding. Yeah. Um, feeding fresh food, whole food diets. Yeah. So, you know, we kind of have to weigh everything. I think they're pretty equally important, but <laughs> yes, well, if you can do both, do both. Absolutely. <laughs> You know, it's hard to do it all. You know, it, 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 life is a lot. And so pick one. And -hmm. right now, you know, diet is always important. Um, but right now it's flea tick and mosquito season. We're about to be right in the thick of it. And so it's time to be thinking about this topic and, and getting started. And maybe this is the year that, um, all of you, are going to go natural. <laughs> yeah. And we so, talked for a couple minutes just briefly about give some, let's give people some ideas of some natural preventatives and tools. Yes. Oh, that's where I was going. going. Yeah. <laughs> Our um, here. I want to throw out something that not many people know about, and that's nematodes. Oh, you can order yeah, nematodes and, and spray your yard with nematodes, and they go into the soil and they yes. love leaves. Yes. And it's a great way to treat your yard, you know, with an organism that absolutely loves fleas and it will, they'll keep your yard free of fleas. Yes. So, and just healthier. Mine so, is, that's you awesome. know, I use the commercially available um, natural flea tick um, and mosquito yard spray. Mm-hmm. And guys, it works like a charm. I mean, you, if you have a problem, you're going to have to treat every 21 days, the life cycle of a flea is every 21 days. Um, if it's in your house, but you know, things like human grade diatomaceous earth, which is available at pretty much every hardware store under and, and better pet supply stores. Diatomaceous mm-hmm. earth is incredible. You can put it under your couch. You can put it under your rug. You can put it in a pet's bed, you know, under, mm-hmm. you don't want them to like inhale it and right. run the risk of getting it into the, the lungs, but outside in the yard, around the perimeter yard. of your fence, around your foundation. And mm-hmm. if you're not familiar with diatomaceous earth, um, go look it up, go to Home Depot, ask them about that, go to Ace Hardware, go to your independent pet store and ask about it. Um, but some people even put it in their pet foods bowl to kill mm-hmm. internal parasites but it will kill anything with a hard exoskeleton. Um, yep. Spiders, oh, a funny note, because we, we use it here at the store. And last year when we did our diatomaceous earth treatment, I swear to you, every spider under the sun started popping out. <laughs> they just came out from everywhere. And, you know, we have the woods surrounding our store. It is very natural. And so for about mm-hmm. two to three weeks, we were just seeing spiders coming out of everywhere and having to unfortunately kill those little things. But diatomaceous earth it will kill anything with a hard exoskeleton except for spiders, apparently. 
<laughs> but um well, uh, spiders spiders are good house guests they are they will they, kill all the they'll they'll eat all the little buggies they <laughs> are and that's that's the the um what's the word the dilemma it's because I, I know you that you're really good it's like snakes i mean y'all are good for things but sometimes you know we just can't have them here too many of <laughs> you are not good too many not of in my house good yeah um, so here, here was a natural, um, pet pest spritz that, um, is in the book and it's one teaspoon of neem oil, one teaspoon of vanilla extract, one cup of witch hazel and a quarter cup of aloe vera gel. So the, the aloe vera gel is the binder, if you will. Um, but the, in the witch hazel will help the neem oil to disperse within the solution. Um, the vanilla extract will help the neem oil last longer. And the neem oil should be from a health food store, a very high quality essential oil um, manufacturer or a health food store. So just those ingredients in a um, container that you can spritz, you know, all over, you know, your dog. And it says when you're doing like natural things to repeat it every four hours, if you're going to be outside more than that. Mm -hmm. so, and you can use it on yourself. That's what I like. You can spray it on your carpet. You can, it's not harmful, but yet parasites hate it. And that's just one of so many yeah. natural options. I wonder if that's safe for cats. Is there anything in there that would not be good it, for cats? We don't know. I had the same question, Pam. And you poor kitties get left out so many times. This particular chapter that um, I had been reading was all of really about dogs. dogs. So maybe we we need yeah. to find something. You know, I know like um, Wonderside would here in Earth Animal, the the brands that we carry, they have a cat mm -hmm. version that is. Different yeah. than the dog version. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Good. And I know that I like, I recommend the Flea X by Feline Essential a lot because that works well for a lot of, a lot of cats. But I know, Jessica, you also know that Anim Animalio has oils that are safe for cats too that can make a spritzer mm -hmm. or a spritzer out of. Yeah. There isn't anything on the Animalio website that you can't use on any animal. Yeah. So everything they, I mean, the, there are going to be certain blends that she recommends for certain animals, but, um, and then some of them may be, too, some blends may be a little too strong for cats and she'll like put that in the notes, but mm -hmm. yeah, they're all safe for, yeah. uh, for all animals, like horses, cows, goat, like all animals. <laughs> um, yeah. But I also with our, our yards, I think that's the first step is your yard um, for me, at least, because yeah. if our home environment is clean and well cared for and we are intentional about what we're doing in our yard, then we can just by doing that, we have dramatically decreased the risk of fleas and ticks specifically. But I think there are also things we can do for mosquitoes in our yard. Um, so I am very intentional about what I plant yes. in my yard because anything in the mint family, we've mm -hmm. got catnip, rosemary, lemongrass, lavender, yes. all of these things and, and more because there, there, there are more in the mint family. But I, I'm very intentional about what I pick out and what I plant around my home because they are good for the turtle. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes. We have a lot um, of, of rosemary for that reason. And it's amazing um, how it works. It's just it's yeah. shocking. <laughs> In a I good know. Way. I, you know what? I woke, I woke up the other morning and went outside and I was, I, I went over to, I have some catnip plants and two of them were like, like something had burrowed in them overnight. And I was like, somebody let their cat out last night. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great place to sleep. That's cute. Aw. Kitty. Yeah. Um, so I'm very, very intentional about what I want to plant and the, and 
you know, the plants I have around my house and keeping it clean and keeping things cut back. Um, you know, when we were, lived in San Diego, we had to be very um, intentional about keeping because there was the house we were in had a lot of old, old shrubs and plants. So they needed a lot of pruning, a lot of pruning um, because San Diego is known for having tree rats and they will mm-hmm. like they love the, you know, shrubs and stuff because they get so thick and dense. Mm-hmm. And um, so, you know, just be like really aware and caring for <laughs> your property or if you rent, then you know, staying on top of your landlord or, you know, whoever runs the apartment complex of, I mean, you're, you're paying for this property to be kept up. So, you know, stay on top of them and do what you can in in that situation as well. But yeah, I love, I love Animalio, um, because I just feel super comfortable with everything she puts out and she has three different blends for, um, pest control so that you can find what works best for you. Mm -hmm. And I know where you live specifically um, because different essential oils will work better in different areas of the world. Um, Just like different plants naturally grow in different areas of the world. Uh, I, I think one of the most important things we can ever say is that, you know, nature provides anything and everything we could ever want or need, whether, you you know, we have as humans have really kind of messed up our environment quite a bit, but at some point there was a really viable option in nature and still is a lot of times for Mm -hmm. whatever we need, whatever our pets need. So I like to look, look to nature as much as I can. Um, Which is why I think essential oils are are high quality, veterinary grade essential oils are great for for our pets. But, um, I mean, I'm happy to tell you guys what I do for my cats and my dogs. And just because we've talked a little bit about, you know, we live in central, all three of us, we live in central Texas. And when people think about central Texas or Texas in general, they think, oh my gosh, it's you know, horrific there. And I kind of alluded to that earlier that I was terrified moving here because I did want to keep my pets natural as -hmm. much as I possibly could. Um, and I was more concerned than anything about heartworm. I think like, you know, you, you walk into a veterinarian's office, I don't care where you live, you can live in Maine or New Jersey and they have, um, you know, the, the picture. Yes. (laughs) Yes the model yeah. or a jar yeah. of all these heartworms. And it's terrifying. It is. Um, because you don't want your dog to go through that. Mm-mm. And, you know, it's fear. It is fear Driven. making the decision for you. And we should never make a decision in fear for anything in our, <laughs> in our lives, not True. just life our lesson. pets. Mm-hmm. For sure. So I, and I was scared. So I, I actually bought, like I went through Dr. Falconer's free heartworm course and I still wasn't confident. And I bought his, you know, paid version of the heartworm course. And I just read and read and read everything I could get my hands on about protecting my dog from heartworms. Mm -hmm. And what, I boiled everything down to is first of all, my cats are indoor, so they're good to go. Mm -hmm. Like I don't, I don't do The only thing I do specific to my cats is that I did buy, um, wonder side and I will use it on the exterior Mm -hmm. of my home when I feel like I need to, um, anything else. The only other thing that I ever really have a problem with, with my cats isn't even really related to my cats, but ants. We will get ants because of like cat food or whatever. (laughs) And I use cinnamon because Mm -hmm. ants won't cross over ground cinnamon. Um, so that's just because you live in central Texas and it's hot as hell and there's not enough water. Ants want to come in to find (laughs) water. Yeah. They want to come in to find water for sure. Um, and, and I, if I can find where the ants are coming in, I will caulk wherever they're coming in. 
And I generally have to do this about once a year. I will go around and just, are there cracks? And, you know, we're in a new house, so settling, and there are going to be new cracks. Um, so I fill all the cracks I can find with caulk. And, you know, that's the number one deterrent for ants. <laughs> and then I will use cinnamon because it is all natural. Mm-hmm. Um, my cats don't really get into it. I mean, cinnamon, you know, I heard you say the other day, Pam, is not like super awesome for cats, but it's not going to really a little bit isn't going to hurt them either. They just wouldn't necessarily like the taste, you know? Yeah. So like if they get their little paws in it, Oh yeah. Not a huge deal. Um, so that's all I do for my cats. And then with Kimberly, my dog, um, she is raw fed. And so she does get all whole food diet and, just kind of a, a side note, I actually wanted to say this earlier, um, especially for people who are just like dead set on my dog is super healthy, um, but they're kibble fed or they're getting all these vaccines and flea and tick and all the things, but they think their dog is healthy. There are actually lots of tests out there, and I don't normally recommend a lot of testing for <coughs> otherwise healthy animals. But I mean, if you feel like you need to prove something <laughs> to yourself, there are lots of different, there are nutritional analysis testing, there's gut health testing, there are allergy and food sensitivity. T- there's lots of different testing we can do for our, our pets that is relatively new um, that we can, we can do and we can prove to ourselves and see. And uh, I've had to make some changes with my dog because of the testing that I've done on her. And, um, so I keep her as healthy as I possibly can through not over vaccinating her through limiting her toxic load as much as possible. So I don't use chemical cleaners in my house. Um, we don't use chemicals on the lawn, Mm -hmm. all all of, all of that. Um, not over, I just say not over vaccinating. I don't over vaccinate. (laughs) Um, so I keep her as healthy as I can and I supplement when necessary. And then I test her for heartworms twice a year, which my vet thinks is excessive, but it makes me comfortable. It makes Mm -hmm. like, I feel more comfortable knowing that twice a year we're getting a negative heartworm test. Yes. And outside of that, like, I'm not even good about putting the essential oil sprays on her. It'll happen sometimes yeah. I'm not even good about it. <laughs> um, but that's, that's what we do. And then I, you know, I, I wipe her feet when she comes in. Cause if, if we go for a walk somewhere, I can't control what other people put on their, their yard, what, what they put on their lawn, Right. I wipe her feet. And I just really, really heavily focus on keeping her vitally healthy so that she is not an attractive host Correct. for mm-hmm. pests and parasites. And I'm in central Texas. So like, yeah. <laughs> you know, I know people out there are listening. Like, mm-hmm. yes, yeah, people really are out there listening in like Canada. You know what I mean? That it's like, you have very, very little. <laughs> Although is uh, it Canada that, um, Dr. Becker talks about with ticks? I know there are, there are, is it just the Northeast in wood. general? That yeah, they do have a lot of diseases, um, yeah, wooded areas and yeah. countryside in some places. Yeah. Of, yeah. You know, and that mm-hmm. goes back to, you know, looking at assessing your risk and then making the best decision. And if it, you know, it ends up being that it is a chemical, then support the system with, the, you know, a proper detox protocol. Yeah. You know, I, I know we, we already talked about Animalio, but Dr. Shelton, who is a formulator for Animalio, she put up a video maybe two years ago where she went out because she's in Minnesota and um, she has a lot of, you know, country yeah. land mm-hmm. yeah. um, and barns and stables yeah. and all the, you know, um, so there are a lot of ticks on her property. And, uh, she sprayed one sock with um. perfect essential oil and one sock she left without it. And the ticks would not go on the sock that had, but the, the sock that didn't have anything, they were crawling all, like she had Ugh. ticks crawling all up Ugh. and she was like freaked out. She was like, this is horrible. I hate this, but I'm doing this for you so you can see how good this is. That's when you grab the and essential then- oils and you spray those suckers. <laughs> 
she, and watch yeah, them die. Well, then she she sprayed the top of that sock uh-huh. that the tick was crawling up, and when the tick got hit it, it uh-huh. turned around and started crawling back down to the ground, which is yeah. not normal for a tick, right? Mm-hmm. Their whole goal is up, 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 up. Let me get mm-hmm. let me get yeah. up as quick as I can and attach. Like that's their yeah. whole mindset. Ugh. That goes back to what we were talking <laughs> I about. I the creepy that- crawlings. <laughs> there are natural oh. deterrents. Natural prevention is effective. As mm-hmm. a- that is an actual deterrent, right? Actual. When deterrent. we talked earlier about the neurotoxins, they're not deterring anything. No. No. The they're- natural essential oils are actual deterrents. Yes. Mm-hmm. And you know, um, you mentioned one of the products that we use in our yard, and. and um, it's cedar wood and is it peppermint oil that's in it as well? Mm-hmm. No, it's not peppermint. It's cedar wood. They, I think they have a lemongrass one. Right? There is a lemongrass, um, rosemary and lavender. Um, but, and just going back to being in central Texas and we're about to be in the throes of the season. And that's when it's funny because I have the spray bottles inside and outside of my patio door and as all five of my little dogs and big dogs go out i'm spritzing them and i spray me and i spray the um the doormats i spray the threshold and that's just the part that's you know right there in our living space i'm not talking about the yard um or the fence line but i do get very active with it during the season as we call it in the mm-hmm. winter i don't worry about it because we don't have an yeah. issue um right so i'm glad you shared the way that what you do just yeah and- i have i have one other thing that i do during the season and that is that i i feed garlic to kim yeah. how much garlic so, is it per 10 pounds do you know off the top of your head it's like I, I want to say it's a quarter teaspoon per 10 pounds off the top of my head. It's, it's not much. Yeah. Um, and I, I have a whole blog post about how to feed it, but you don't want to feed anything pre-chopped or frozen. Um, you want a fresh, preferably organic <laughs> yes. head of garlic, a clove of garlic, um, chop it and let it set for about 12 ish minutes before you feed it so that the, the Kemp, the, um, aroma, it's like out, it, I think it produces, it produces, um, something called Allison, mm-hmm. A-L-L-I-C-I-N or something like that. Mm-hmm. And that's the active like compound from the garlic that is going to, pr- so you want to give it time to create that compound. Um, and then you don't want to let, let it sit too long. <laughs> you want to feed right. it before it like goes away. So there's like, there's a a time window in there. Um, but like I, I tell people, if you're not going to take the time to do that, don't, don't even feed the garlic. It's not worth it. Um, but that's how, how I feed it to Kim. If if you are the person like me here, hello, I would never do that. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not patient enough. Huh? I have a a cat client who actually started using that for her cats because the raccoons that come into her trees in her yard would drop fleas in the yard. Even, you know, she Mm. was having trouble. So, um, a 16th of a teaspoon every other day has done the trick. That's awesome. For a cat. Yeah. I know. I thought Dr. Judy was going to, I thought Dr. Judy was going to break the internet a while back when she was like, yeah, you can give garlic oh, to cats. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're talking tiny amounts and it's, you know, it's enough that you can mix into their food and, and it's, it's working. It's working beautifully. That's awesome. So, I love that. Mm-hmm. So what do you do for your cats, Pam? Cause I know they do go outdoors. Yeah. You know what? Nothing because I have never seen a flea on them. I have never seen a flea on me and I go out there barefoot and walk in the grass and work in the garden and all that stuff. So if I don't see anything on me, then I'm not too worried about them and they don't stay out all day. They'll stay out for maybe 30 yeah. minutes and they'll come in, you know, so they're not, they're not running around in the woods and 
you know, they're mm-hmm. enclosed in a, in a, in a yard space. Um, but we, I don't even have mosquito issues right over here either. And, and if there are mosquitoes outside, I'm not outside. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to be around yeah. them. Um, but we have citronella candles out there on the patio. You also raw feed it. them. And I raw feed them. You have good, and they're clean, healthy, healthy pets. Yeah. Your pets are not so, attractive to parasites. No, they're really not. <laughs> they're really mm-hmm. not. They're not. But that you took know, a lot of, that took effort, you know? It did. <laughs> and it's not, you don't get there overnight. I remember when I was starting with these spritzes and the sprays and, um, you know, if, if y'all knew me, listeners, I'm one of the most skeptical people that has trust issues and that you'll ever meet. And I have to research everything and I have to hear everything multiple times. You know, just going to throw that out there. So I was bringing these products home and reading about them and determining what I was going to bring into our store. And um, I'm sitting in the backyard where we do not have rosemary planted. We have rosemary all in the front. The front yard is heaven. We never, I'm going to knock on wood, um, never have a mosquito. Um, and in the backyard, we didn't plant rosemary. So we, we treat it with the Wonderside yard spray. So, you know, there were a couple flying around and I sprayed um, Charlie or Hank, one of the Aussies, and I sprayed me and I watched this mosquito come, you know, here's my arm flying in and it just took off like a force field was there. And mm-hmm. so just like that tick in the experiment that um, she did, that's was the experience for me is that it didn't ever land on me and it didn't land in my dog's fur um, because it works. It prevents it from you know, your pet from becoming a host. So, right. You know, we use back to the garlic I use during um, this season where we actually, it's a 30 day ramp up before they say that your pet is naturally protected. Um, we use a powder that goes in the food and it's a garlic base, but it, and it's integrative veterinarian, um, Dr. Bob Goldstein. He's been an integrative holistic vet since the seventies. Um, he and his wife are wonderful people that um, have created an entire natural line for, mm-hmm. you know, parasite control. And they have other, you know, safe chewing products and a food that they just came out with last year. But um, it, it's doctor formulated. And we use that. And all of my team switched when they, they hired here, you know, to come work here. One of the things is, is that, you know, you've got to believe in a more natural way of, you know, treating your pets and feeding your pets. And do we have kibble? Yes, we do. We've talked about that before. Um, but in this topic today, they all have converted to using, you know, all the natural sprays and this powder that's a garlic base, like you were talking about. I just, Mm -hmm. I'm too impatient to do that. I think it's beautiful that you use whole, I mean, anytime you can use whole food, that's awesome, you know, so. Yeah, Yeah, well, and I only have one dog. True. That (laughs) kind of. (laughs) Forget about that. (laughs) (laughs) I do. Um, Our counter is, I mean, we cook for the dogs, not for ourselves, but yeah, (laughs) five is a lot. Uh, And that kind of brings me to like, for me, it is easier. Like I, when I'm sitting on the couch at night, whatever time I have, it's generally not much watching whatever show before I go to bed. I, my dog is right there beside me and I'm petting her and I'm probably brushing her and I'm looking and checking and feeling and like, it just, it's just part of my routine. I don't even think about it. Yeah. And again, you know, that's harder when you have five or six dogs, but <laughs> we have a foot on one pet and another one, one in, underneath your arm. Literally it, the, we have the living room, the entire rug, the ottoman, the, the couch has got fur, furry little friends on it. <laughs> and I wouldn't have it any other way. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. Y'all are great pet parents. Y'all are great pet moms. (laughs) 
well, so are you. We learned. <laughs> we learned how to do better. Yeah. And yeah, that's you know? what we hope and encourage our listeners to do. Mm-hmm. Ask questions, do the research, you know, and if they wanted to ask us a question, Jessica, how would they do that? I think the easiest way is just, you know, on our social media. Um, there yeah. is a, there's a, there's a form on pethealthjunkies.com for like, if you have somebody or somebody wants to be a guest on the podcast or they, you know, have a recommendation for a guest on the podcast, that kind of thing. But, um, mm-hmm. I think if you have a specific question, you know, reach out to one of us on our social media. For me, I think the best way is Instagram. It might be different for, for yeah. you ladies, but um, all the way, you know, send us a message or, you know, um, w- if we're creating content, you can comment on the content that's mm-hmm. w- w- with a question as well. That That's kind of twofold. It helps boost the content so other people can see it. Um, and also gives us an avenue to potentially create new content in, in answering your question. So, Mm -hmm. um, we can help other people. So that, that might be a good, good way to do that too. Awesome. Thank you ladies. Yeah. Thank you both. I think this was, this was awesome. Um, I am committing to creating some, uh, um, creating a carousel for when this podcast goes up. So make sure to check, check, uh, social media. I'll put kind of the, the basics, <laughs> the bullet points, the cliff notes of what we talked about and, uh, put that in a carousel post on social media. So you can, uh, go there and hit the like little save button. So you can go to your collections and uh, pull that information up whenever you need to. So, okay. Wonderful. Yeah, Thank you. With that, I think, yeah, I think, I think we'll go ahead and say, um, have a great rest of your day or evening whenever you're listening. Thank you for, thank you for listening. Um, and if you haven't already hit the follow button, please do and rate the podcast. If you would, I think Apple will allow you to rate the podcast and that just helps one, it helps us know that you like the content, but also it helps Apple know that like other people like you on their platform may be interested in this content as well. So mm-hmm. that's kind of the best way to, to help, you know, push this content out to as many pet parents as we can. Yes. Thank awesome. you. So, thank, you. Right. thank you for being yeah. here. Thank you. <laughs>